You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Tomorrow is the Lunar New Year, kicking off days of celebration for the Spring Festival with the promise of lots of food and festivities for everyone celebrating the Year of the Dragon. One thing that often marks this, or most holiday seasons, really is a lot of travel, heading home. And coincidentally, that's what happened this morning for the Axiom 3 crew. They safely splashed down off the Florida coast, and they hitched a ride on a crew dragon, no less. T-minus. 20 seconds to LOS. T-rest. Go for the floor. Today is February 9th, 2024. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. AX3 splashes down in Florida. We have mission updates for Polaris Dawn, Rocket Lab, and True Anomaly. Signal Ocean to partner and invest in Spire Global. And our guest today is Joe Bullington, manager in the Jacobs Space Exploration Group in Huntsville, Alabama. Joe will be talking to me about the importance of community engagement in the space industry. Such a great chat. Stay with us for the second half of the show. On to today's Intel briefing on this Friday. And after a few weather delays to their International Space Station departure, the Axiom 3 crew have finally safely returned to Earth. The all-European astronaut crew of the Axiom 3 mission splashed down off the coast of Florida just this morning. The crew returned to Earth in a SpaceX capsule that parachuted into the Atlantic Ocean after undocking from the ISS two days ago. The astronauts spent approximately 435 hours over 18 days in space and completed 288 orbits around Earth, covering around, I don't know, 7.6 million miles. Turkey, Italy, and Sweden financed the private mission to the ISS, paying roughly $55 million apiece. The crew has returned with a plethora of completed research data. They executed multiple international outreach engagements during their two weeks on the orbiting lab. And this was Axiom's third private mission to the space station, and the fourth is planned later this year. We have some mission updates for you now, starting with the highly anticipated Polaris Dawn mission. SpaceX's private mission was due to lift off in April, but unfortunately has already been pushed back until the summer. The mission, being led by billionaire Jared Isaacman, will spend up to five days in Earth orbit. Polaris Dawn will be the first of three flights in the Polaris program, which Isaacman wants to help push the boundaries of private spaceflight. The Polaris Dawn mission took to the social media platform X to say that, quote, the additional time continues to provide necessary developmental time to ensure both the completion of mission goals and a safe launch and return of Dragon and the crew. Rocket Lab has set the launch window for AstroScale's Orbital Debris Inspection Demonstration mission beginning on February 19th. The On Closer Inspection mission will deploy the active debris removal by AstroScale Japan satellite. The mission is the first phase of an orbital debris removal program, and during this phase, the satellite is designed to test technologies and operations for approaching and monitoring debris objects, and delivering data that will assist in removing it to ensure the sustainable use of space for future generations. The first of two of True Anomaly's Jackal autonomous orbital vehicles have arrived at Vandenberg Space Force Base and have completed functional testing, fueling, and mating to the SpaceX Falcon 9 rideshare plate. The satellites are officially ready for launch as part of SpaceX's Transporter 10 mission, which is expected to lift off no earlier than March 2024. Data and analytics company Spire Global has announced a partnership with SignalOcean, a leader in shipping technology. The partnership will see Spire contribute to its proprietary data sets, relevant for precise monitoring of the maritime domain, 
and SignalOcean will bring its expertise in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing to create new innovative solutions to propel the digitization of the maritime economy while enhancing global security and transparency in our oceans. And as part of the agreement, SignalOcean will make a $10 million investment in Spire Global. And we've talked a lot about the success of the Space Force's rapid response test called Victus Knox. And now the U.S. military branch is looking to its next mission, dubbed Victus Hayes. The Space Force wants to achieve similar satellite delivery and launch timelines with this new mission. But this time, the spacecraft will be required to showcase the ability to maneuver from a real-time threat. Wow. The mission is expected to be launched next year. And the goal of Victus Hayes is to prepare the Space Force to shift to operational missions by 2026. Rogue Space Systems has announced that it is suspending the active phase of its Barry 1 mission. Barry 1 was launched on November 11, 2023, and has been in orbit since then. It was designed to test the company's scalable compute platform and its ability to aggregate data from multiple sensors and process that data in real time. The company's press release says that they experienced ongoing power system issues on the bus through launch and early orbit phase, and after two months of operation, towards the end of that phase, they lost communication with the satellite. And unfortunately, they also did not have a chance to test their customer Evo's quantum drive. Rogue Space is investigating the cause of the loss of communications and will provide updates as they learn more. The European Space Agency has unveiled a new portable lab. Hosted within a standard shipping container, the ESA Transportable Optical Ground Station, or ETOGS, can be transported all across Europe as needed to perform laser-based optical communications with satellites, including NASA's Psyche mission, millions of kilometers away in space. ETOGS will serve as a flexible testbed for optical telecommunications hardware and systems, and can also support other activities that require looking at the sky with a telescope or pointing skyward with a laser, such as space debris monitoring or orbit determination via laser ranging. The UK Space Agency says it will fund work which aims to prolong the life of satellites as part of efforts to ensure that space remains sustainable for future generations. The funding will include a £2 million upgrade to the Satellite Applications Catapult in-orbit servicing and manufacturing facility at the Westcott Space Cluster in Aylesbury. The facility will provide unique capabilities in the UK where companies can verify, validate, and demonstrate a range of in-orbit operations, including manufacturing, servicing, inspection, repair, and assembly. An additional £1.5 million is going into feasibility studies on refueling satellites in space to extend their life and reduce the amount of space debris. And that's it for our briefing for today. You'll find links to further reading in our show notes. And we've included a piece from CNBC on how bankers read a potential sale of Rocket Builder ULA and sweet little blog post from JPL about saying goodbye and thank you to everyone's favorite Mars copter, Ingenuity. Those links can be found on our website, space.n2k.com, and just click on this episode title. Hey, T-Minus crew, tune in tomorrow for T-Minus Deep Space. It's our show for extended interviews, special editions, and deep dives with some of the most influential professionals in the space industry. And tomorrow we have our full chat with Joe Bullington, where he's talking about workforce development and mentorship. Check it out while you're walking the dog, cooking dinner, or I don't know, recovering from the lurgy as Alice is today. Feel better, Alice. Anyway, T minus deep space. You don't want to miss it. The start of the year is a great time to take that next step in your education, career, and beyond. Rely on N2K Certification Prep to provide the tools to help boost knowledge, skills, and confidence to get you there. And now for a limited time, all N2K Certification Practice Tests are 40% off. 
Visit n2k.com slash certify and use promo code N2KVDAY. That's N2KVDAY to save 40% on your purchase. That's n2k.com slash certify with promo code N2KVDAY. Offer ends Monday, February 19th. Happy learning. Our guest today is Joe Bullington, and Joe is a manager in the Jacobs Space Exploration Group in Huntsville, Alabama. And JSEG provides services through the Engineering Services and Science Capability Augmentation Contract at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Joe has mentored many people in the space industry, including T-minus producer Alice Carruth. So I spoke to him about the work that he does in advocacy for the space industry. So I've always been involved in community organizations and uh, later on getting get into professional and business organizations. And I, I really get a, a big charge out of that. I think there's something that's needed and um, I enjoy doing it. So, for example, one of the first ones I got into was the AIAA, which is, you know, it's, it's like the biggest uh, all-encompassing aerospace organization. I've been uh, multiple different leadership roles in, in that organization, local chapter leadership, and also on the uh, computer systems technical committee at a national level. Um, in recent years, last 10 or 12 years, I've been involved in another organization called uh, International Test and Evaluation Association, which is very aerospace related. I'm currently on the International Board of Directors for that organization. Then there's some other things. I know you've talked to other people. Um, so New Space Nexus, which was formerly New Space New Mexico, I'm one of the founding members of that. Still, still involved with uh, with with that organization. I, I helped stand up a couple of other organizations that are aerospace related. Um, one of the big things for me, in terms of these uh, different organizations and particularly the th- things that help kids get interested, as well as even mid career adults, is the aerospace industry and, and technology more broadly. If you, if you grow that in an area, it's a huge economic driver for the area. It provides good jobs. As those jobs grow and, and the companies come in and spend money and the people get good paying jobs and, and pay their taxes and shop in stores, it, it grows the, the economy for everybody and, and helps, you know, helps to the prosperity of a community. So to me, that, that aspect is at least as important as the technical cool factor of it. Yeah, and I'm going to be really soft here for a minute, but it's also so inspiring it really helps people dream about something that maybe they thought was totally out of reach for them. In addition to the the really important economic value, which cannot be understated, that softer side too of uh, giving somebody a, an ambition that maybe wasn't there before, it, it really changes lives. It really does. So other things I guess I would say to people to emphasize this is if you're interested in um, aerospace, space flight technology, if you go looking, there's a ton of information out there, you know, thousand times more than it was when I was getting started. Anybody that's got access to the internet, there's there's so much information out there. And I would say just go out there and start start learning. You know, just search for things that interest you. Uh, that'll lead you to other things. Get involved in organizations. And um, if there's online events or online, any kind of opportunities to learn, you know, do that. And think about, is it good to go to school and, and get a degree? technical degree, or um, you don't have to be an engineer or a technician to work in the industry. They need other things. They need um, all kinds of uh, support functions, uh, lawyers. They need uh, people to help with logistics and uh, administration and all kinds of things. So if you're interested in space, there's a whole bunch of different careers you can go into that that are part of the space industry. The more you find out about it, the more valuable you be. And as you said, more uh, fired up and interested and inspired, hopefully you'll be about about going into the industry and uh, it'll, it'll help you grow and progress. We can't emphasize enough what you just said so well about how many different roles there are in space. And uh, it's wonderful if someone wants to get a degree and, and go into engineering. I mean, I, I encourage that 100%. Uh, and, and, but it is also not everybody's path, and that's okay too. So, um, yeah. Joe, you, you, you are involved in so many different organizations, which is amazing. Do you connect people between these orgs? Like, um, how does that work? Like, there, there's a whole ecosystem, in the, especially in the aerospace world, of all these different organizations doing all these various things, and they overlap a little bit. And, yeah, can you tell me a bit about that? Yes. Um, 
actually, that's one of the reasons uh, that I, I'm in multiple organizations. First, I get something, something from each one of them. They're, they're different. They have different things. But yes, I do try to make connections between people and organizations uh, because of that being involved in different things. Um, I was fortunate during the years I was, particularly recent years that I was at uh, NASA White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico, that part of my job for a number of years, in addition to being a department manager, to do uh, outreach on behalf of my company and, and NASA. So I got to spend some extra time. I've always done that, but I got to spend some extra time. And uh, especially in, in, in southern New Mexico, I, I was um, doing a bunch of different orgs and things, including, by the way, the, being on the board of the Chamber of Commerce and we're trying to use all that, again, to help help the workforce development aspect, to help the economic growth uh, development aspect, and again, just to help inspire kids and, and adults, you know, to be interested in, in that whole world of aerospace and space flight and, and to realize what, what it, there is there uh, and, and available to do. Yeah. I'm very curious also, given the course of your career and the amazing perspective that you have, especially in managing people, I'm wondering if you've seen uh, changes or I'm just thinking we're sort of we're in a new space era. We're in a new space race or a new space age, whatever whatever people call it. And I'm I'm wondering if you're seeing the new classes, the new cohorts of people coming in. Is there sort of like a different feeling? Is there something sort of driving them that might be different from the past or is it always the same? Or I'm I'm just really curious. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion about that in the whole business and, and job world. And it's certainly in the aerospace industry. So I think in general, a trend that's happened over the years is uh, when I was first getting started, you know, you were expected to be very focused on the job all day, every day, is be available whenever needed and all that kind of stuff. In recent years, I think not just with new, younger generations, but I think it's true of other generations. People want to have a better work-life balance. And and I'm uh, fortunate to work for a company that, that supports that. We We have to get the work we do for NASA here is very important, and we're all fired up about doing it, but we're encouraged to, to have a good work-life balance. I think another thing is the technology is so universally available and has been for a while. You've, you've heard stories about you know kids or, or young people that are 15, 16 years old that are already master coders because that's, there's so much information available now, and they get interested in it. So you know, not everybody is that way, but it's not unusual to have somebody come in with just amazing skills in, in some aspect of technology, particularly computers and software, um, when they come into the job, which helps a lot for them to get started and to make them valuable to us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, I would imagine some things have are always going to remain where people want to solve really interesting challenges, obviously the love of space, <laughs> and like doing really fascinating things and working and building things that have never been built before, doing something new. Um, that, that is a huge part of the appeal, at least for me, <laughs> I imagine. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, helps us to get some of the best and brightest, you know, is that they, they want to work on NASA projects or they want to work on other aerospace projects because, it is inspiring. It's something that, you know, really captures the imagination and it makes people want to get involved and, and, and excel and do good things. Of course, in, in recent years, as you know, the, the commercial space industry has just grown tremendously, which is providing a lot more opportunities for people. And it's um, there. The commercial space companies are doing some of the things that NASA has traditionally done, but that's that's OK, because um that's part of the NASA's you know, vision going forward is they're not going to try to do everything anymore. They, want, they need uh, the commercial space companies to, to uh, provide some of the services and it's happening and, and it's, it's picking up at a rapid pace. And that, again, that provides a lot more opportunities and, as well as inspiration. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So you know those minutes of terror when a spacecraft re-enters the atmosphere and radio contact with the crew inside the capsule isn't possible? It is high drama in movies and real life. Remember the six minutes of terror for Apollo 13. So why does this comms blackout happen? 
The superheat of the friction of reentry through the atmosphere, whether that atmosphere is Earth's or Mars's or any planet's really, well, that all ionizes the air around the craft, and then radio signals from the ground can't get through. This is still a problem for crew capsules that are reentering the Earth's atmosphere today. And you might remember that the space shuttle actually was able to mostly avoid this issue, partially because of the shuttle's unique shape, which kind of made a hole in the superheated ionized envelope, allowing the shuttle to speak to Earth during reentry, thanks to NASA's TDRSS network of satellites above that it spoke to. Now, odd shapes are not something you can bet on for future space missions, but maintaining comms during what's normally a blackout with satellites above, well, that's something worth hanging on to. And SpaceX is going to be giving that a try with Starship. It just so happens that there's already a convenient network of satellites in space for it to talk to. Yes, that would be Starlink. And that is why SpaceX has filed plans with the FCC for Starship's next orbital flight test. From start to finish, launch to fingers crossed reentry, the rocket will be outfitted with Starlink terminals. Yes, basically the same ones that consumers can buy right now, just with a revised enclosure and mounting, both on the Starship spacecraft and on the Super Heavy booster. This experiment will help SpaceX to see if and for how long they can maintain communications with Starship. Just another thing to keep an eye on when Starship flies again. Hey, what's old is new again. That's it for T-Minus for February 9th, 2024. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T- are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K's strategic workforce intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Varmazes. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. <laughs>